Looking to protect your cards? Whether you need sleeves, deck boxes, binders, playmats, or even backpacks, Ultimate Guard has your collection covered. Literally. Premium products offering priceless protection. Visit ultimateguard.com. Hello and welcome to another starter deck upgrade guide for the standard 2023 season. Today we're taking a look at Ignite the Forge, a red-black artifact sacrifice deck. And there's a few ways we can approach this. We can stick to the artifact theme, which will be Ignite Artifacts version 2, which is a more budget-friendly build, and then we go all out with version 3. Or if instead you prefer the vampire synergies in Ignite the Forge, I've got you covered with Ignite Vampires, which is kind of a vampire tribal deck, which we will also take a look at. But step one whenever you're upgrading a deck is to clone it so you can actually make some changes and then we'll be changing the default format from alchemy to standard so we don't have to face those powerful alchemy cards and then it's time to upgrade the deck. Of course, the key card in this deck is Oni Cult Anvil, a two-mana artifact, saying whenever one or more artifacts you control leave the battlefield during your turn, create a 1-1 colorless construct artifact creature token. This ability only triggers once each turn, and can also tap it, sacrifice an artifact to deal one damage to each opponent, and we gain one life. So the anvil can sort of enable itself, as long as we can keep feeding an initial artifact to it, and then we can also potentially sacrifice our own construct tokens just to drain the opponent. So this is the key card. We're definitely going to go up to four copies. The total cost of wild cards for this budget build will be eight common wild cards, three uncommons and four rares. So definitely quite budget friendly, especially considering our rare will be Fable of the Mirror Breaker, which sees a ton of play throughout a ton of different standard decks. Then the next upgrade is Blood Tithe Harvester, which is an amazing card. 2 mana, 3 2 Vampire. When it enters the battlefield, it creates a Blood Token, which is an artifact that for 1 mana we can tap and sacrifice, discarding a card to draw, so it gives us a bit of card selection. But we're just happy to keep those Blood Tokens in play to potentially sacrifice our Oni Cult Anvil and the other various artifact synergies. And then we can also tap and sacrifice Harvester to give a creature minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is twice the number of Blood Tokens we control, can only be used as a sorcery so also gives us access to a bit of removal so not only is this a nice two drop to apply a bit of pressure but we can also use it as removal and then we'll also synergize very nicely with fable once we add that to the deck then next up we go up to four copies of a voltage surge a one mana instant speed removal spell dealing two damage to a creature or planeswalker but if we sacrifice an artifact we can deal four damage instead so that also works very nicely with any blood tokens or treasure tokens that we don't mind sacrificing and Experimental Synthesizer is another one of those key cards, a one-man artifact. When it enters the battlefield or leaves the battlefield, we get to exile the top card of our library, and until end of turn we may play that card, including lands if we haven't played a land yet for the turn. So we typically don't want to play Synthesizer on turn 1, instead better to play it around turn 3, turn 4, before playing a land for the turn. That way if we exile a land we can still play it, and if we exile a 3 or 4 mana card, we might still have the mana to play that card afterwards. And then for 2 in a red we can also sacrifice the synthesizer ourselves to make a 2-2 samurai token, although for the most part we'll be sacrificing synthesizer to other effects like maybe anvil, that way we have more mana to potentially cast any card we exile, as well as maybe a voltage surge for one mana can also sacrifice synthesizer if we need an artifact to sacrifice, so we'll go up to four copies there as well. And then we want to introduce an additional one drop which will be the Voldaren Epicure, a one mana 1-1 one -one vampire when it enters deals one damage to each opponent and creates a blood token so the additional blood token will then also synergize with additional copies of blood tithe harvester so we can potentially take out larger creatures so we'll go up to four copies of the epicure as well and then of course we need to cut some cards to make room for all these new additions. And Ceremonial Knife is pretty weak, takes a lot of effort for it to actually connect and make any blood tokens, so that can easily be cut. Then at 2 mana we're still keeping our 2 copies of Infernal Grasp, can destroy a creature at the cost of 2 life, important for killing some key creatures like Shieldred, which can survive the 4 damage Voltage Surge. Then a Virus Beetle is not bad, a 1-1 one -one that when it enters makes each opponent a discard card, and it's also an artifact creature, so it can still synergize with cards like Oni Cult and I will go down to two copies to make room for some other cards. Then we've got Voldaren Bloodcaster, which of course we will keep in the Vampire build of this deck, but in the Artifact build it's not at its best, as it only triggers off non-token creatures dying, which doesn't happen all that often if we're just sacrificing our 1-1 Construct tokens, so we will be cutting the Bloodcaster, even though it's a serviceable card if you just need a 2-drop. 
A Dragon Spark Reactor we will keep as a 2-mana artifact that can pick up charge counters whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under our control, including artifact tokens that we can generate with Anvil, and then for 4 mana we can sacrifice it to deal that much damage to an opposing creature and player at the same time. And then the Sokens on Smelter is also not bad. A 2-2 saying at the beginning of combat on our turn we can pay 1 mana and sacrifice an artifact. If we do, create a 3-1 red construct artifact creature token with haste. So it can also deliver the beatdowns. We will go down to 2 copies of Smelter just to make sure we don't draw too many of them. Since we usually don't have that many artifacts we can easily sacrifice to it. Then at 3 mana there's Falcon Wrath Forebear, which we will keep in the vampire build of this deck. But it will be cut in the more artifact focus build, which is this one. Then the Professional Phase Breaker is fine, as it can generate a bunch of treasure tokens, which can turn into card advantage, so it can be pretty fun. Scrap Welder, on the other hand, is pretty disappointing, and we will be cutting it. And then a Circuit Mender is also a serviceable card, can gain some life, maybe draw a card when it leaves, but we will also make room for some more powerful 3-drops. And the Searchlight Companion, also a bit low impact, just making a 1-1 token when it enters on a 1-1 flying artifact, will also be cut. And then instead we'll be adding 4 copies of Fable of the Mirror Breaker, the powerful saga that on the first chapter makes a 2-2 Goblin Shaman token that when it attacks makes a treasure token. On the second chapter we may discard up to 2 cards if we do draw that many cards, so a great way to get rid of excess lands that we don't need, or maybe just discard some lower impact cards, and eventually transforms into a reflection of Kiki Jiki, which for 1 mana can be tapped and activated to copy a creature we control that's not legendary, and that copy gains haste and we have to sacrifice sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. So a great in combination with our Blood Tithe Harvester especially, as we can copy it, maybe kill an opposing creature, and make a blood token in the process. And also of course synergizes quite nicely with cards like Virus Beetle and Epicure, that also have a powerful Enters the Battlefield ability. So four copies of Fable will be our three drop of choice. And then at 4 mana, there's two copies of Big Score, which I much prefer in a deck that's trying to ramp out an expensive 6 or 7 mana card with those treasure tokens. Don't like it as much in this build, especially now with Fable that gives us that much needed card selection. Also we have 4 copies of Synthesizer, which wants us to keep the curve low, so we're more likely to play whatever card we exile. So Big Score will go. And similar arguments why we're gonna cut Twin Shot Sniper, kind of awkward if we exile it with a Synthesizer, as we won't be able to channel it for 2 mana, and for the most part Voltage Surge is the preferred removal spell, even though the 4-mana creature can have a bit of synergy with a Transformed Reflection, and can also work well with other artifact synergies, but we will cut it here. And then the Blazing Sky I don't mind keeping as a big 4-mana 4-4 Flying Trampler, that when it dies either makes treasure tokens or provides a bit of card advantage. And then the one copy of Dollhouse I also don't mind as a curve topper, even though it's awkward with our Synthesizer, it's still nice to have a bit of a late game recursion, getting back Harvester especially is nice as we can use it as removal once again, and the constructs also synergize with additional 1-1 tokens from Anvil, and the tokens we can potentially generate with a smelter, so we'll keep the dollhouse. Then I will go down to 24 lands here, cutting a tap land, since we really don't need that many lands now that we've lowered the curve. And then I'm also going to be adding one copy of Tenacious Underdog, which is not going to require any wild cards, since you automatically get one underdog in the black green starter deck. So that's a freebie that we can play, and then gives us a bit of late game recursion with a blitz ability, can also provide a bit more card advantage. And then the last cut, this is a hard one, but I will be cutting the Blood Fountain, even though it has good synergy throughout the deck, as a cheap artifact that makes a blood token. Now that we have the additional graveyard recursion from Underdog and Dollhouse, I'm probably not going to need the Fountain as much, so we will cut that as well. And then we will shift around some basic lands, since we do need more red early, especially with the four Epicures now. So I'll go up to 10 Mountains and down to 8 Swamps. So yeah, this is Ignite the Forge version 2, pretty cheap to put together, and Fable of the Mirror Breaker will see play in a ton of different decks, so it's certainly not a wasted wild card. So yeah, that's our deck, now let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Okay, we're on the draw. Hand seems acceptable, turn 2 Grasp, turn 3 Fable, can discard some extra lands with it. Now a turn to Harvester is even better. And then Synthesizer will play maybe turn 4. Put into red-green with a turn to Beast Caller. Now that is a scary card, although I can still potentially kill it with Harvester or trade for it. Although it's likely to pick up a plus one counter. So it's a close call whether we just use Infernal Grasp. I think I prefer using Grasp for some 3 or 4 mana creatures. So for now we'll play Harvester. And then even if we trade and they get to move the counter elsewhere, that's still fine by me. Turn 3 to plan is Fable. 
and then uh, turn four maybe infernal grasp can certainly discard at least one land to chapter two for now a loam speaker gives a beast caller a counter and I'm fine to trade here if they offer if not it's just going to be a bit of a staring contest might be a tail swipe in our future as well to fight the harvester it's going to be Kumano instead okay so their next creature will get a counter anvil's not bad could play it sacrifice the blood token and make a 1-1 I think I still prefer fable on curve and then hopefully we won't take too much damage here but we can recover with some removal and then pass it back so four minus when we could see the Raichu or the partners it's gonna be partners with an extra counter from Kumano so it gets to put three counters somewhere now at least we can chum block the beast caller with the one ones from anvil for a while So I think I still prioritize killing the partners. Discard double mountain. Okay, Epicure can also chum block if needed. So I don't think I'm playing Synthesizer this turn since I want to Anvil plus Infernal Grasp. And then we can kill the partners. Enables the Shaman to attack. And then I guess if I play Epicure, Harvester can take out Loam Speaker if we uh, want to. I guess it's still reasonable. And then with uh, Treasure, we can still play Anvil. So we'll do that. Kill Loam Speaker, attack. Make a Treasure. And play Anvil. Now we could have also potentially enabled Anvil by just sacrificing a Treasure, but I don't think the sequencing would have worked out that way okay the etching we can take two beast caller will have to chump for a while now I could have also kept my harvester around to combine with a reflection but it's still pretty far away iconoclast 4-3 trample haste for now so I'll be taking six another loom speaker that's fine so I guess we'll jump with the Epicure, even though it will get exiled. I guess Epicure I can copy with a Reflection for more benefits, so we'll jump this way. And then Blazing Sky can at least hold off the smaller creatures. So I think the plan's Blazing Sky, Sack Blood Token to Anvil. Could also attack with the Shaman, I suppose. And then make an extra treasure. Will I need the 2-2 on defense is the question. I probably don't, although it is safer to do so. Now let's attack. And then I don't think I'm playing Synthesizer since I really want this 4-4 in play. And then I'll sack the blood token. Make a 1-1, one -one, gain 1 life. And pass it back. So again, happy to chum block the Beast Caller, and hopefully that's it. And then Reflection can start copying the Epicure if I want to. Can't copy legendary creatures like Blazing Sky. All right, Loom Speaker animates a land. So we're probably going to see an all-out attack here. Okay, so we'll block the Iconoclasts over the lands. Don't know if it really matters. Then chump Beast Caller. And then I think we just chump a Forest here. Take two and keep our Reflection. So we will need something else now to copy with Reflection, but we can always copy the Shaman as well. And our opponent explodes. Yeah, they know that Anvil will take over. And if they don't have a way of giving the Beast Caller Trample, I don't see them uh, necessarily winning here. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, and seems fine. Double Anvil is pretty exciting. And then the Epicure will make a first artifact that we don't mind sacrificing. 
So it's important to have those cheap enablers for Anvil as well. Put on some mono blue perhaps on a Haughty Jin deck. So if we can resolve turn to Anvil, that's going to make it hard for them. Although maybe something different here. But yeah, if they can get a large creature in play, if it flies, it can sort of ignore the 1-1 one -one tokens on the ground. Synthesizer, also a nice draw. But the plan for now is going to be second anvil plus epicure, sacrifice blood token, make two 1-1s one -one right away. So we'll try that. Alright, that's going to be dissipated. Still going to play epicure and make a 1-1 one -one token here. And then the Smelter could sacrifice a 1-1 to upgrade it into a 3-1, and that will still trigger Anvil. Synthesizer provides more sacrifice fodder while potentially providing a bit of card advantage. So opponent is playing a Xander's Lounge, potentially to enable some domain synergies. Who knows? Opponent's just going to pass without hitting their land drop. So is it time for Smelter? I think so. And then we'll wait on Synthesizer for an extra turn. The longer we wait, usually the better. And if they counter Smelter, we're not too upset. Alright, another Dissipate. Fair enough. So we'll attack for two, and then just sacrifice the 1-1 one -one token in play. And then next turn, try Synthesizer. Opponent has a Soaring City as their fourth land. And they fires of victory to kill our 1 1 to potentially prevent us from enabling Anvil. So hopefully Synthesizer resolves here. It does. Exiles yet another land, but at least we can still play it here. And then it may be worth it to sack our Synthesizer now. If I exile another land, I wouldn't be able to play it, but. Kind of want to re-enable the anvil, and then we can still play a 3-drop we exile. Fire's Beetle also counts. And attack with Epicure. Opponent discarding a Wandering Emperor, so that was pretty good value. They might have another one in hand, who knows. Voltage Surge, a way to potentially finish it off. So we're flooding a bit, finding a Fable would be a way to discard our lands to find more action. So that's a high priority card. We could have also decided to sack Synthesizer to itself to make a 2 2 Samurai, but then we probably wouldn't have been able to cast whatever we exiled with it. Alright, so let's uh, hit for 3. See what happens. And play a Caves. In this spot, I actually would have preferred the other tap land that draws a card, but that's pretty rare in Standard where you have this much time to actually. Spent mana to draw. And then I probably should have used Anvil end of turn, but kind of forgot. Now we're going to miss out on one damage, because if I use it now, then it doesn't make a replacement 1-1 one -one token. So just missed out on one activation. Bankbuster can draw, that's fine. And a Reactor is not bad. So hit for three. And then the Reactor can maybe help us uh, close out the game. This time I'll make sure to activate our Anvil, which will immediately put an extra counter on the reactor too. Opponent draws. Okay. So reactor up to two counters already. We've got the mana to sacrifice it at any point. Their opponent doesn't have much time left. Bangbuster draws, that's pretty desperate. Two mana remaining, and if we get to untap and there's no interaction, they should be dead. Even with another land. Sacrifice token, make a 1-1. One, one. Opponent's at 2, and then Reactor can finish them off. Awesome, on to the next one. No 
Okay, we're on the draw. This hand will need some black mana eventually, but actually don't hate it for now. Got some early removal. And then Synthesizer can also help us hit our land drop. Put on blue-green. And a Visionary, so it looks like a ramp deck. Alright, actually don't mind killing the Visionary here with Voltage Surge. Question is whether I play a Synthesizer first. Might be worth it if we exile a land, we'll be able to play it. If it's a Swamp, I guess I wouldn't be able to Voltage Surge after. Maybe it's worth it to wait one more turn. Although if I hit my land drops, it would really be nice to play a Fable next turn. So let's try Synthesizer here. And yeah, I guess it works. Found a Voltage Surge in Exile. So we'll kill Visionary, sacking Blood Token. Still three Voltage Surges in hand, so really hoping for a, a land to play Fable here, as our opponent plays another Visionary. Did not get there, but I guess it means sacrifice Synthesizer and hope for a Swamp. Alright, just a mountain instead. So at least next turn we can play Fable. Opponent's also stuck on two lands, so we're both struggling. Topiary Stomper will get them up to four. Can still eventually kill it with Voltage Surge. And this won't be able to block in the near future at least. So we can still maybe connect with our Shaman token. And there's our Swamp, perfect. Still liking Fable here, get that going as soon as possible. And then next turn, maybe Anvil. So there's still hope. Joint Exploration for Ramp. And a bit of card draw. Keeps both on top. So once your opponent gets to 6 or 7 mana, they could start casting Titan of Industry, which is pretty rough for our deck as it can take out Anvil and our various enchantments as well. Okay. What do we want to discard? I feel like Beetle is fine, but I probably don't need Mountain. Question is, do I need another Voltage Surge? I think one of them can go. Since we can kill Stomper and then whatever they play next is probably too big for Voltage Surge anyways. So let us attack and then... Probably play Anvil. Play Beetle using the treasure, that way we also trigger Anvil. Opponent might have a negate. They don't. Right, make disappear to counter our beetle. Fair enough. Still get a 1 1. And we'll pass. And now a silverback elder. That card is definitely a problem. 5-7, so can't kill it with Voltage Surge, and that can potentially blow up our artifacts and enchantments. So we're gonna need an answer right now. Infernal Grasp would be the easiest solution. And that's not it, so... Yeah, that's rough. Play another Virus Beetle, which is also fun to copy with Reflection, but we probably won't get to untap with both of them. Put on discarding another counter spell. And yeah, there's no easy way around this, I'm afraid. Just gonna play underdog. And then sack 1-1, one, one, drain the opponents, make another replacement, and pass. And hope for the Elder to make an attack, but I doubt it. Six mana, two cards in hand, and a Workshop Warchief. They probably start by taking out Reflection. Opponent actually looking for lands to enable Topiary Stomper. Alright, so we've got another turn with our Reflection. And 
our opponent's going to pass. Epicure is a draw. Okay, so I can make them discard with Virus Beetle. Do it now. Opponent was holding a Sky Turtle, so glad we made them discard. And then I'm just going to Volta Surge now, I suppose, or I could attack with Underdog, hoping they block with Silverback Elder, since we want to start escaping it anyway. And that's probably it. Alright, they're going to trade for Warchief, that's also fine. And then I'll just kill the Stomper itself, sacking the Beetle that's about to go away. Still leaves the silver back, which can easily dominate this game if they string together a few creatures. Now we can start blitzing underdog to generate a bit of value. Opponent hangs back. Okay, can also sacrifice my blood token to loot. But uh, let's see here. Reflection, copy Virus Beetle again, I suppose. Make them discard. And then Blitz Underdog. And attack with these two. And that's probably it. Those die, can sacrifice to drain them for one. And see what we pick up. And play this one. And then next turn maybe use the blood token to discard Swamp. Okay, just a land, so dodge the bullet there. And then do I want to maybe copy the underdog now with reflection? That could be worth it. Attack with both of these. And then probably send in the 1-1s one as well now. Maybe just every one attack. Sure. But I'm still blocking the underdogs. Bone falls to five. So they're getting pretty low. And then... Now what? Do I play Fable? That seems fine. Makes a 1-1 with Anvil by sacking the treasure token. And then I can still use Anvil in the opponent's turn. Okay, so if they don't have a creature here, they could be dead next turn to an all-out attack. And our opponent explodes. Awesome. So luckily for us, Silverback did not find enough creatures to keep enabling it. And the red-black artifacts got it done. So yeah, that's our version 2 of the deck. Still pretty budget-friendly. But if we really want to go all the way, then we can go to version 3. Which is very similar to the deck I featured not too long ago. Of course, this was before the Meat Hook Massacre ban, so I replaced Meat Hook Massacre with Shieldred the Apocalypse, and this is the final build. So we've got our two copies of Weatherlight completed. Not a must have in the deck, but I've been enjoying it so far as a way to scry, eventually draw cards if we sacrifice enough creatures to it. Great synergy with Anvil, of course. Went up to two copies of Tenacious Underdog. Got two copies of Reckoner's Bargain to sacrifice an artifact or creature to draw two at instant speed. Can be a way to maybe sacrifice an Epicure, which doesn't always do much once we play it. So that can provide a bit more card advantage. And then at three mana, we also have two copies of Obnixilus, which can also sacrifice a creature with casualty, and then can start draining the opponent with the plus one, can make devil tokens with the minus two. And then we also have two copies of Braid's Arisen Nightmare, which is another way of sacrificing our cheap creatures or artifacts to either make the opponent sacrifice a card with the same type, otherwise we get to draw a card and the opponent loses two life. So Braid's is also excellent in this type of deck. And then the mana base, of course, got a pretty significant overhaul with now all eight of these red-black dual lands. And then we also have the channel lands Crucible 
and Abandoned Mire. And then, as I mentioned, two copies of Shieldred, which is also an excellent curve topper, also good synergy with Fable and Underdog that can draw additional cards, which can turn into life gain with Shieldred in play. So yeah, that's version 3 of the deck. I'm not going to feature any specific gameplay for this, since I'm just going to refer to the red-black sacrifice video I did a few weeks ago. And besides Meetup Massacre, the deck will play out just the same. So take a look if you're interested. Otherwise, we're going to move on to the vampire build of the deck, Ignite Vampires. So this one will require quite a few rare wild cards. So I don't recommend it if you're looking for a more competitive deck, but a ton of fun if you just like the vampire tribal synergies, as we're now maxing out on four copies of a Voldaren Bloodcaster. Two mana to one flyer, saying whenever the Bloodcaster or another non-token creature we control dies, create a blood token. And when we create a blood token, if we control five or more of them, we get to transform it into the Blood Bat Summoner, a 3-3 flyer, saying at the beginning of combat on our turn, up to one target blood token we control becomes a 2-2 black bat creature with flying and haste in addition to its other types so unlike the artifact focused sacrifice deck this deck often wants to hoard a few blood tokens so it can eventually enable the blood bat summoner to start making 2-2 flyers and then of course we also have the full set of falcon wrath forebear a 3-1 flyer that cannot block and when it deals combat damage to a player we get to create a blood token and can pay a black mana sacrifice two blood tokens to return the forebear from our graveyard to the battlefield so it gives us a nice bit of graveyard recursion and then four copies of the sanguine statuette which is an artifact enters a battlefield creating a blood token and whenever we sacrifice a blood token for any reason we may have the statuette become a 3-3 vampire artifact creature with haste until end of turn so it can also help us beat down, can even activate it in the opponent's turn if we can sacrifice our blood tokens. And then of course we're still playing the full set of Epicure and Harvester since they have great synergy with blood tokens. Still have the same removal with Voltage Surge and Infernal Grasp. And then at 3 mana we're also packing the full set of Vampire's Vengeance. This is one of the payoff cards for having this Vampire Tribal deck, dealing 2 damage to each non-vampire creature, and we also get to make a blood token. So now with the Meat Hook Massacre being banned in Standard, people might experiment more with Go White token decks, and then now Vengeance is the perfect answer answer as potentially a one-sided board wipe that also makes a treasure. We've got two copies of Florian just as a nice value engine, a 3-3 first ranking vampire saying at the beginning of your post-combat main phase look at the top X cards of your library where X is the total amount of life lost by your opponents this turn, get to exile one of those cards and play it this turn as well. And then at 4 mana we've got some awesome curve toppers with the Maid of Dishonor, 4 mana 4-5 four, legendary vampire. When it enters a battlefield or another vampire enters a battlefield under our control, we get to make a blood token, only triggers once each turn. And for 2 mana we can also sacrifice another creature or blood token to drain the opponent for 2, so that can also quickly add up to help close out the game. And then two copies of Henrika, a 1-3 legendary flying vampire, saying at the beginning of combat on our turn, choose one mode that hasn't been chosen. Between each player sacrifices a creature, we draw a card at the cost of one life, or we get to transform Henrika into the Infernal Seer, a 3-4 flying a life-linking death toucher that can also potentially increase its power. So Henrika is another great way for us to sacrifice Epicure, can also enable our Bloodcaster at the same time to make additional blood tokens, so it just has great synergy throughout the deck. And then our mana base also has a few goodies in addition to the red-black dual lands. We've got four copies of the Voldaren Estate, which can also make additional blood tokens and becomes cheaper to activate the more vampires we have in play. So this is my take on red-black blood token vampires. Of course, a pretty big departure from the original Ignite the Forge, but hopefully you can still enjoy it. So let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Okay, we're on the play. Hand seems promising. Epicure into Harvester and then Florian for a bit of card advantage. Let's see what we're up against. Turn one island. Hit for one. Play Harvester. And then we won't be getting any card advantage next turn from Florian since we'll be tapped out. Opponent bounces Harvester with Fading Hope. So yeah, next turn probably still go for Florian. Still got to make an extra blood token in the process, and our opponent's gonna found the third path. And uh, yeah, maybe they've got some graveyard synergies of their own. For now, attack for one, play Florian. If we had more mana, of course, want to play Florian first main phase so we can actually 
get some benefit from it. Opponent will cast a Sunset Revelry for free. Gaining for making two one ones. And then could kill one of the one ones, so Florian at least provides a bit of advantage here. And then attack, I'm fine with a trade. Okay, let's see what we get. And wouldn't be able to play the Maid of Dishonor, so it's between the Voldaren Estates or a Bloodcaster. Probably prefer the Bloodcaster since we have plenty of lands already. And then we can get up to three Blood Tokens pretty soon, so we're not too far from transforming this. As our opponent discards some very large creatures to their Faithful Mending, so they're probably going to try and reanimate those next turn. So that's concerning. For now, attack, and then see what we get with Florian before deciding what to play next. And how about a Harvester? Four bears also. Tempting as a Flyer that can make more Blood Tokens. Yeah, I think I get the Forebear actually, that way if there is a Sweeper, we can still get it back from the Graveyard. Four mana. So Invoke Justice is at five, so that's not a concern this turn. So I guess we attack. Could see Wandering Emperor in the meantime, but that's okay. And just a Fading Hope on Florian instead. So we won't be getting any additional card advantage. Well, at least if they tap out for an Invoke Justice to get back Hullbreaker or Jankataxius, they won't necessarily be able to stabilize the board. So maybe I play another Forebear. That way if there is a Sweeper, I can still pay the black activation for both Forebears to get those back on the battlefield and then threaten to put the opponent to one. It's gonna be a Thirst, putting the opponent to six, so now double Forebear's lethal. So even a Sweeper is not enough. Opponent discarding Leer as well. So yeah, the Graveyard Recursion here, proving to be quite valuable. Could also kill our own creature with Voltage Surge, just so we can get another Blood Token and transform a Bloodcaster, but that's not going to be necessary, and our opponent scoops it up. Okay, we're on the draw. Hand seems pretty balanced. We'll give it a shot. Opponent on a green deck, and we can play Castle here, turn one. Okay, turn to, I guess, statuettes. Hit for one. And double Florian for card advantage. As our opponent finally plays a Jewel Thief. Also have a different line available where we play Bloodcaster and then Voltage Surge sacking a Blood Token. That way the statuette also gets to attack. Yeah, that's actually reasonable since Florian doesn't provide any value this turn. So hit for four. And then next turn, Bloodcaster flying over can maybe exile land with Florian that we can still play. As a Cemetery Prowler, we'll give their creatures a discount after exiling Jewel Thief. So you could still see a 3-drop. Opponent passes, and a Vampire's Vengeance could come in handy. For now, play Florian, and hope to attack with a Bloodcaster. That works. 
and lands since we won't be able to play the voltage surge. Okay. We can animate statuette in the opponent's turn by sacking the blood token, but don't see that happening. So it's going to be a silverback elder. That's a problem, although we can kill it with infernal grasp if there's no protection spell in place. And a loam speaker is going to enable it right away. And they're going to take out statuettes. So that's fine. I could animate it by sacking the blood token. And then I'll get another token in return. And I guess I get to improve my hands, get rid of a Florian. Seems worth it. Okay. And Prowler attacks. So we'll take it here. So I can Infernal Grasp Silverback, attack with probably just Florian and Bloodcaster. That way if they block with Prowler I can finish it off with the Vampire's Vengeance. I guess we could attack with all and hope they also block the Epicure with a Loam Speaker. That would be the best case scenario. Sure, I guess it's worth a shot. Their best block would be Prowler on Epicure. And that's what they go for. Alright, fair enough. At least we still get a blood token from the Bloodcaster here. And then finds a, a land we can play. Although I think I've already played land for the turn. So just a Vampire's Vengeance then to make a blood token can cast it now. So we're up to three blood tokens, and this can make it four, so we're very close to transforming Bloodcaster, which can close out the game pretty quickly with our opponent seven. Augur of Autumn to play lands off the top, and they have enabled Coven, so they can even play creatures now. So that's scary. And a Storm the Festival, wow. Let's see what they hit. Kodama and Defiler of Vigor. That threatens to close out the game very quickly. So, let's see here. Can we somehow get lethal? Seems tricky. Voltage Surge helps. I can activate Castle. That's going to cost me four total if we count Castle itself. So, I won't be able to combine it with Vengeance. This also has a reach, so... Yeah, I think we're probably dead here. I guess I can pass and then try and block with first strike and then finish off the defiler somehow. But they still get to combo off with Augur in the meantime. We're at 8. Maybe my best chance is to find something with Florian. So let's kill Kodama, sacking a blood token so I have more mana available. Attack with Bloodcaster. And then see what we find. All right, Maid of Dishonor is not bad, I guess. Play that. Although I won't have the mana to sacrifice any blood tokens. So we'll see if we can survive this turn. If our opponent can cast a few more permanents, we're probably dead. Silverbacks, pretty good. Counters on everyone. And another Defiler. Yeah, that's a lot of trample damage coming across. So Maid can block Augur. Jump Prowler and then we still die. So that means I would have to block Defiler and then I can survive, but then we lose our maid, which was probably my best way out, since this could have drained the opponent to death by just sacking a few blood tokens next turn. I guess we will get some uh, blood tokens at least. 
But uh, yeah, this isn't great. So we go to one. At least Bloodcaster transforms. So we've got five in the air. We still need four points of damage out of nowhere here. And a forebear doesn't quite do it. So I guess we can loot with a blood token. Discard forebear. Find an epicure. That's one more point of damage. And I guess we keep going. Statuette would have worked if our opponent didn't have any blockers back. So, yeah, I guess now we just uh, try again. And a land, that's not gonna do it. So are we out of options now? I think so. Discard land. Or maybe Epicure, what if I hit another... Bloodcaster, that doesn't necessarily do it since we're out of blood tokens now. And just a Haunted Ridge. So yeah, I think that's uh, game over, sadly. Animate a blood token. Hit for five, put the opponent to three. And then we could get back the forebear, but of course doesn't have haste and doesn't block. All right, opponent can uh, close out the game here with their defilers. Yes, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, and seems fine. Turn two Harvester, turn three Forebear, opponent to red-green. And then late game we also have our estate to potentially activate. Henrika's not bad. I think I like Forebear here. Also, don't feel too bad sacking it to Henrika, potentially. Since we can always bring it back from the graveyard. Put on maybe a red-green werewolf deck. And a lightning strike kills Harvester. Okay, in that case, probably just attack, play another forebear. Could have also gone for Henrika, draw a card. Also, then the opponent can more easily play around Henrika's Sacrifice if they see it coming. It's gonna be a Tovalar. Okay, so now Henrika looks pretty good. Sacrifice a creature. And then we can bring the forebear back end of turn. Can do that in the opponent's turn as well. Caretaker's not bad. Although luckily we've got tons of flyers here, so we can sort of ignore the ground. So we'll bring this back. And then the haste on the ground's not gonna matter. So probably just playing another forebear, and then I might have the mana to activate my castle as well, since we control four vampires, so that's very cheap to activate. And Tenrika, I'm not opposed to transforming just to get more damage across. Could also pump Henrika. Um, I guess if I had not played forebear and just activated twice, we would have had lethal here. Alright, so small misstep. But this is cooler. Get to activate our castle, make a bunch of blood tokens, and maybe find our uh, blood caster to transform our blood tokens into bats. And at 23, don't see my opponent killing me here. Stormseeker can give itself haste. So we are going to take a pretty big hit, but 
Putin's definitely dead on the way back. So let's make a blood token. Could even sacrifice a blood token here to discard swamp, see what else we get. But yeah, opponent's very dead. Awesome. So yeah, that's kind of the battle of the starter decks, you could say, although red-black vampires does require a pretty substantial investment if you want to get all those rare vampires. So I wouldn't recommend it if you haven't opened a bunch of those Innistrad packs already and happen to have a lot of the vampires. But of course, a lot of fun if you get all these synergies going. And I do think two damage to all non-vampires could be pretty well positioned if the aggro decks, especially in best of one, take over now with Meat Hook Massacre being banned. So yeah, that's going to do it for today's gameplay. Let me know in the comments which starter deck you would like to see upgraded next. But for now, I want to thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel. And you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.